So um, this talk is about implications of obesity in breast cancer-related lymphedema and physical therapy evaluation and interventions. So the learning objective is to identify the correlation between BMI and breast cancer-related lymphedema, to define what constitutes body composition, to review different methods to obtain body composition, identify what is the best type of exercise to change this body composition. So in the U.S., the most common cause of secondary lymphedema is breast cancer treatments, will affect one in five of the two million breast cancer survivors. About 40% of women treated for breast cancer who had any kind of radiation to the axilla or axillary dissection will develop lymphedema. Obesity or higher body mass index increase the risk. The peripheral tissue, lipid transport, and homeostasis will be in part determined by normal lymphatic function, weight gain, and obesity increase fat deposits seen in lymphedema. Mortimer did a study which showed that lymph drainage is lower in obese subjects versus a lean control group. So for centuries, we know that the fat gets transported by the lymphatic system. Just recently, the researchers started to explore the relationship between peripheral fat and lymphatic function. So what is VMI? VMI is um, an attempt to quantify the amount of tissue mass in an, in an individual and categorize it as an underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. So the incidence of obesity has led to the recognition of a new nutritional entity called sarcopenic obesity. And this is characterized to have a low fat-free mass or lean mass and a high fat mass. And you can have a normal VMI or you can have an increased VMI. As well, a lot of research has been done about the correlation between VMI and breast cancer recurrence in postmenopausal women. So the goal of body composition measure is to evaluate the nutritional status by measuring the fat-free mass and the fat mass. So true body fatness is the combination of this body fat and that fat-free mass. And then within that fat-free mass, we're looking into viscera, bone, and muscle. So when we're looking at a body composition measurement, we're looking at a percentage of fat, bone, water, and muscle. So you can have two people with the same sex, the same VMI, but they can look totally different. So you can have Mrs. Smith on one side who look pretty fit, and perhaps they have an, she has a normal VMI, but her fat mass is pretty high and her fat-free mass is pretty low. And on the other hand, you can have Ms. Ackerman who can have a little bit of a high VMI, but her fat-free mass is pretty high and her fat mass is pretty low. She's in a much better nutritional status. So VMI is not necessarily a good way to actually judge that body composition in someone. So through time, numerous ways of body composition measurement have been developed. We have hydrodensitometry, nuclear magnetic resonance, anthropometry. DEXA is one of the, um, is one of the um, ways in clinical research that they utilize body composition, look at fat mass, um, fat-free mass, and vulnerable bone mass, and as well is able to identify metabolic risk factors like, like um, high triglycerides. The anthropogammetry as well look into total body potassium. The CT has been utilized more lately to look into that. And the bioimpedance is one of the devices that we have in the clinic, who um, you guys already know about it, but use large frequencies that are able to penetrate in the intracellular and extracellular space and measure total body water and extracellular water. Impediment came up with a new device uh, called the Zozo, who had a combination of body composition, bioimpedance, fluid status, and able to help out um, to develop health and wellness programs. We have as well um, the Embody that we um, have in the clinic, and this look as well, and this body water composition, and as well skeletal muscle mass, fat mass, and visceral mass. Fat mass, sorry. So fat mass and muscle mass can be altered by physical activity, and as well, we can decrease it by diet. However, 
We can make those changes on body composition, but the VMI sometimes doesn't change. Again, it's another reason why we shouldn't be utilizing VMI to look into this body composition. So the mass and loss can be utilized as a predictor of chemotherapy toxicity. So we have a surveillance program who we developed with Dr. Singhal five years ago. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But one of the things that we do during that pre-op is this body composition. So what has been given us is numbers right from pre-op where we can actually identify if somebody has a low fat free mass and we can then educate the patients and start to give them the right exercise prescription so they can actually change this to avoid this chemotherapy toxicity. In the other hand, if they have a high fat mass, then we can again educate patients and start to give them the right exercise prescription so we can actually put them in less risk to develop lymphedema and possibilities of breast cancer recurrence. So the analysis of body composition methods allows quantitative measures of tissue changes through time. They allow for higher sensitivity than VMI and weight loss for detecting fat-free mass changes. So the hydration the hydrate, sorry, hydration status is an important clinical consideration in the long-term management of chronic disease like cancer. So the ideal is for our cancer patients is to have um, <clears throat> a maintaining um, intracellular water and extracellular water ratio of three to two. So a study done by Stephanie et al. looked at 145 cancer patients from 2013 to 2016. They received one line of chemotherapy and were post-chemotherapy one to two years before entering the program. The total body water in the general population is about 55 to 60% of the body weight in adult males and 50 to 55% in females. So they look at six minute walk tests, a hungry dynamometer, a 30 second seat to stand. Aerobic intensity was prescribed at 60% of the peak heart rate, treadmill walking, and a resistant training of three sets, 10 to 15 repetitions, and a Mediterranean diet. So at the first examination, six months and 12 months, body weight, VMI, and hip circumferentials and hydration status were determined. Hydration status include total body water distribution and was estimated using a bioelectrical impedance. So exercise is largely recognized as an important tool to regulate total body water distribution. It is clear that the combination of aerobic exercise and resistant training improve global fitness, cardiovascular performance, and quality of life for our cancer patients. So at the 12-month mark, all the subjects' body weight and VMI were unchanged. However, there were significant changes in the body water distribution. So Mehara, who we actually will have the pleasure to hear tomorrow, and suggests that the pathophysiology behind obesity and lymphedema is unknown. The disease is characterized histologically by fibrosis and abnormal adipose deposition. And clinical studies have provided evidence that obesity and postoperative weight gain are significant risk factors for the development of lymphedema. So he did a prospective level study of 137 patients with breast cancer. VMI higher than 30 had three times the risk to develop upper extremity lymphedema compared with patients that have a VMI less than 25. Other studies suggest that changes in body composition can influence adipose deposition and lymph volumes in these patients. Another study was done, um, 936 patients found that patients who develop lymphedema had a higher baseline and current body mass index compared with those who did not. So this suggests that lymphedema is a form of regional obesity and lipodystrophy of the affect extremity that may be modulated by changes in diet and body type. So certain of these results increase production of lymph from an enlarged lymph that overwhelms the capacity of the lymphatic system, a consequence of external compression of lymphatics by adipose tissues or a direct injury to the lymphatic endothelium by changes in body weight or diet. So he felt that obesity and lymphedema are reciprocal, and we hear that this morning as well. So we know for sure that obesity impairs lymphatic function that lead into adipose deposition and obesity and proliferation and hypertrophy of local adipocytes that become chronically inflamed and infiltrated by macrophage and lymphocytes. 
There was another study shown in a most model of lymphedema that, um, that impaired lymph flow results in inflammation and um, massive upregulation of uh, adipocyte differentiation genes, like what you see on the slide. I cannot really read that. Um, this common accumulation of interstitial fluid can lead to activation of adipocyte differentiation and proliferation. So they did a, um, they feed wild mice with high fat diet for eight weeks. And the results of this was um, they found a small lymph node size, loss of follicular patterning, and a decreased lymphatic capillaries. As well, what they found with some of the mice that had um, a defect on some gene called the IPOE had an increase of cholesterol circulating and that show abnormal lymphatic levels, decreased interstitial fluid capacity, and impaired trafficking of immune cells. So between 2005 and 2011, 787 newly diagnosed breast cancer underwent to a prospective arm volume measure pre and post BMI calculation. Lymphedema was not noted when the relative volume changed more than 10%. Maybe we need to change that now, right, after your talk. Uh, results of this pre of VMI, more than 30, were significantly associated with an increased risk of lymphedema as compared with the pre of VMI between 25 and 30. So as a consequence of external compression of lymphatics by adipose tissues, or even a direct injury to the lymphatic endothelium by changes in body weight or diet. So we started this project five years ago with Dr. Sinhol, and we continue going on. So when a patient comes to us, we get diagnosed with um, breast cancer, they see surgery, and they see us right away. And I think we're pretty much targeting at least 95% of these patients. Um, they see medical oncology, radiation oncology. We do an individual plan of care develop, and then we see them post-op, usually at two weeks, and then every three months or six months, accordingly to their risk. If we see any changes, of 10 units, again, we may have to change that, in the LDEX or two centimeter difference on circumferentials, we will continue with physical therapy interventions and reassess them every three weeks. If they're doing well, we follow them up to five years. So what that has to do with body composition? So one of the things, again, like we've been really finding out that has been helping our patients is when we do that pre-op visit, we're able to then identify these fat-free mass values fat mass values, and they start to educate and create interventions right then. So for patients, for patients who have a low fat-free ma fat mass, um, has been a really good tool to start to do a good exercise prescription and prepare them better. Mainly, they're going to have some kind of neoadjuvant therapy or chemotherapy. Um, so, and as well, we start to really educate more patients that had a high fat mass um, on the risk of lymphedema. So when the patient comes to us for that pre op visit, besides range of motion, posture, gait, you know, muscle, muscle test, it's specific for lymphedema, we look at skin assessment, bilateral lymph, limb girl measurements, assessment of trunk, volumetry, spirometry, bioimpedance, body composition, and quality of life. So I know exercise is an effort, and not everybody enjoys doing it. However, we know that increased cardiovascular function elevates mood, increased red blood counts, boosts the immune function, improves sleep quality, decreases nausea, and decreases estrogen positive tumor recurrence, and then up to uh, 34%. So that's low volume, high intensity interval training elicits superior benefits versus low to moderate intensity training in cancer survivors. So, what does this HIT concept mean? use of a small dose of high-intensity exercise to elicit physiological responses, such as increased VO2 max and positive metabolic changes in skeletal muscle. The study was done on 85 cancer survivors for 12 weeks. They, had, they were excluded. They have any kind of meds uh, to the brain bone, um, high blood pressure. Um, they had a um, quality of life and measurements, uh, as well anthropometric, DEXA, um, body composition, and hip and waist circumferential as a baseline and post-intervention. So exercise during and after cancer uh, treatment has been shown to, say, to be safe and improve fitness levels and improve quality of life. Because of this, um, there are significant interest in the clinical use of exercise as an adjunctive therapy to improve cancer-related um, um, health outcomes. So there were significant improvement in functional capacity 
cardiovascular fitness, lower limb strength, and waist circumferentials in participants who complete the HIIT group versus um, the low group. Uh, quality of life improved with the um, LIV HIIT group. So maintaining improved functional capacity and lower limb strength in cancer survivors is essential and enhance survivors' ability to move and carry out physical activities during and after treatment. Building lean muscle through exercise builds a healthy metabolic profile that assists in improving risk factors on those who become more sedentary due to cancer treatments. So there was another study looking into does um, high-intensity interval training on body uh, composition and inflammatory markers in obese postmenopausal women. So they did two groups. One include um, a high interval training and the other was a combined training. The combined training was 60 minutes of walking, a 70% max of heart rate, and um, a resistant training, a 70% of one RM. The HIIT group did 28 minutes, about 80% of their heart rate. Both groups trained three times a week for 12 weeks. Body composition and inflammatory markers were analyzed with a dual energy X-ray scanning. They both reduced body fat percentage and visceral adipose tissue. So the combined intervention was most effective and induced beneficial changes in body weight, body composition, glucose, insulin resistance, and triglycerides in overweight and obese adults. And the last study was done looking at the effects of resistant training on body composition, muscle strength, and functional capacity in elderly women with and without sarcopenic obesity. So again, they have a total of 49 women. There were two groups. They did um, a program consisting of two weekly sessions for 12 weeks. Um, all measurements were assessed at baseline and post-intervention. They were anthropometry, muscle strength, and functional capacity. The non-sarcopenic group actually improved most of that, decreased body um, percentage of body fat, waist circumferentials, waist to hip radio. So the 12, 16 weeks of um, intervention improved adipocyte indices and gains in muscle strength and functional capacity. Moderated exercise coupled with resistant training increased muscle strength and flexibility, improved conditioning, bone protection, improved mood and weight control. Studies have shown that gaining weight during and after treatment raise the risk of cancer recurrence, breast, colon, and prostate cancer. So the take-home message, if you have an opportunity to start utilizing body composition on your patients, is going to really create a good avenue for us talking about early intervention, right? So we can start our education and the right exercise prescription and hopefully put this patient in less risk to develop lymphedema.